Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. Hallelujah. And that is the final word, praise the Lord, of Psalm 115. We continue to make our way through the Psalter, the song book of the ancient nation of Israel, and it was also the song book of the first century and earliest church, and has continued to weigh heavy upon our thoughts, our meditations, and has continued to be a means of comfort and strength right to this day, and rightly Rightly, so it is. I wish to speak with you about becoming, becoming like what we worship. This was a common theme that was held out in the ancient world of the Old Testament, that the idols of the nations round about the children of Israel, that they could have hands, but those hands would do nothing, feet that never moved, eyes that could not see or perceive, all of these things. We will come and consider how that we must be careful that we do not become like what we worship. We must be very careful about what it is that we worship. The psalm begins, not to us, not to us. It is repeated, it is stated twice, not to us, Lord, but to your name give glory. In, psalm, in, in Isaiah 48, verse 11, God plainly declares that my glory I will not give to another. God's glory, the radiance of his person and all of his majestic acts, all of the glory that was accrued to that 
God said, there is no way that I will allow vain, empty idols to receive the praise that is coming from those mighty acts of my own arm. My glory I will not give to another. Here we have in this psalm, which does not have a superscription, it does not give the name of the author nor of the setting in which this psalm was specifically coming out of, it is beginning with that line, not to us, not to us, O Lord, but to your name give the glory. Here we have the heart of a mature believer who is saying, Lord, I want to line up perfectly with what your desires are and what your priorities and values are. Lord, I know that it is in your heart that only you should receive the praise, honor, and glory. And that is what we desire as well. And we are begging you, do not let us take any of the glory for ourselves. Let it all be laid completely at your feet. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here, in a similar way, we are imploring the Lord to do exactly what the Lord would wish to have done and to see accomplished. Not to us, not to us, O Lord, but to your name, let all of the glory be directed in one and only one direction. Here we have a maturity, a spiritual growth that is taking place, and it is a beautiful thing when we wholeheartedly pray and move in God's direction, when we are not coming with feet digging into the dirt, when we are not being dragged, but when we are rather pushing and when we are rather encouraging and when our hearts and our prayers are moving pointedly in that very direction. It's an indication, as I say, of growth and of God's goodness to us. The second verse says that why should the nations say, where now is their God? We remember the ten plagues that took place in Egypt and that through those ten plagues, God led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery and out of bondage, out of those more than 400 years of the Egyptians' heavy hand. Though the Israelites initially came to Egypt, and delivered Egypt. It was God's instrument of kindness. But yet the tables had turned and the people had become a desperate threat to the Egyptians. But God, he brings them out through those ten plagues. And it was God demonstrating his power in the mightiest nation of that day in the mightiest power that the Egyptians could not say, well, there is no one greater than us. God came along and said, excuse me, I am supremely greater than you or any of your gods. The Egyptians were humbled when God came and knocked on their door. They had to take that infinitely lower place and realize that a greater power had come. The nations and the name of God. In Exodus chapter 32 and verses 11 to 13, we read of how that God was angry with the people. Exodus chapter 32 Verses 11 and 12, Moses is entreating God. 
Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. God was saying, I am going to obliterate these people. But Moses, he stands up and he says, Lord, Lord, what about your promise? What about your reputation? Then in Exodus chapter 33 and beginning with verse 14, God had said, look, you guys go on and I'll send an angel with you, but my presence shall not go with you. And Moses, he says, that's not good enough. Exodus chapter 33, verse 14, God said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence, Moses says to God, if your presence does not go up with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? How will it be that we may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Moses was concerned that God's name be glorified and lifted up. Is this not the ultimate taunt that is made here in Psalm 115? Where is your God? Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard someone else, a believer, who is going through a sore trial And they're asked, where is your God, the one in whom you have trusted so confidently? Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, the religious leaders said, let God save him if he delights in him. And Jesus, he himself said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Elijah, you remember him on Mount Carmel when he taunted the prophets of Baal, he talked to them, where is your God? Well, maybe he has gone on a journey or maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's gone into the washroom and he can't come out quite yet. Call him louder. To the children of Israel, to the believer, very often this taunt comes Where now is your God? Why should the nations speak such things? The truth is given in verse 3. Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Indeed, our God is on high. Our God, the single, the solitary, the almighty Their gods, their idols, they are many. There is a multiplicity of them. But they're just silver, they're gold. They sparkle for a little while, but they are not on high. They are on this earth, and that is all that they are. They are of the powers, and they are of the abilities and the influences of this earth, but our God, he is the one who reigns on high. Verses 4 to 8 talk about their gods, and whereas the taunt has been directed toward the believer, here now the realization and the examination, it's like Isaiah when There's the word, come now, let us reason together, says your Lord, says your God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. 
Though our thoughts be askew, though our thoughts be horribly off the mark, God says, come, let's have a look at this. You say that God, the true living God, is absent. He is in the heavens. He watches over his own. But let's take a look at these idols. Let's take a look at their ability to speak or to see or to hear or to smell or to work with their hands or to move about with their feet or to make a sound with their throat. They are utterly unable to do any of those things. All of those things are completely beyond them. We find this several times as we make our way through the Old Testament. We come to Psalm 135 and verses 15 to 18, and almost word for word, the psalmist once again, he utters these very words. But we also go to the mighty prophets. We go to Isaiah and chapter 44, and let me read a few verses for you, beginning with verse 9. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know, so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to break bread. And he makes a god to worship. And makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire over this Half he eats meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha! I am warm. I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, a graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Thank you, Isaiah. Then we go on a hundred years, and we come to the great prophet Jeremiah, and Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. Hear, what the, hear the word which the Lord speaks to you. This was just on the knife edge of the Babylonian captivity. Why were the children of Israel Deported? Why did God allow his people to be taken into captivity? It was because they had first been taken captive by the gods which had drawn out their hearts and they were idolaters. Jeremiah bravely, he speaks against this. 
He says, hear, hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. For the customs of the peoples are delusion because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They decorate it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers so that it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Here we have it, that the people were paying attention to that which could neither harm them nor help them. How foolish, how very foolish. But verse 9 in Psalm 115 is the big change. Here there has been a comparison. There has been the nations who have been taunting the children of Israel, the nation which was to be those who believed in God. And they said, where now is your God? And the children of Israel, they confidently say, our God is in heaven and he is watching over his own. But your gods, they are no gods. They are silver. They are gold. They are wood. And they can do absolutely nothing. And so the rousing, the strong impetus that comes in verse 9, trust in the Lord. First of all, it's addressed to all the Israelites. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. Then, it is addressed to the house of Aaron. That was the leadership. That was the religious leaders and the chief priests. Oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. You who fear the Lord, it doesn't matter whether you were born within the covenant community of Israel or whether you have come from someplace else like Ruth the Moabitess, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is, he most certainly is, their help and their shield. The Lord is declared to be the one who is mindful and he will bless us. Blessing the house of Israel, the house of Aaron, he will bless those who Fear the Lord from wherever they come, from the north or the south, the east or the west. Those who come and call upon the name of the Lord shall know his blessing. He will bless those who fear the Lord. The small, those who are humble, those who are meek and lowly. He will also bless the great and the Prayer is, may the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, the one who has made the heavens and the earth. The heavens, they are God's heavens. They are the work of his hands. The earth he has given to the sons of men. And the conclusion is, that the dead do not praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. But God, each and every one of us, have dwelt in a spiritual graveyard. We were absolutely dead in that place and rotting in our sins. The dead do not praise you. Those who have not been quickened by the Spirit of God, 
They have no ability to praise the Lord. Those who go down into silence. But the final word is, as we trust in him, as we look to him for all of his goodness, for his kindness to be upon us, we, verse 18 says, but as for us, the contrast is between the dead and the living. God having quickened us, having made us alive, us having come before him and bowed before him, having turned from our wicked ways, having sought his righteousness rather than any righteousness of our own, having come before him. As for us, we will in turn bless the Lord. From this time forth and forever, our word will be hallelujah, praise the Lord. Join with me in prayer, please. Lord, we come before you and we hear of how that the world boasts of its great things. We hear of how that the world puffs itself up, how that it would want to vaunt itself. Lord, we would find our confidence, we would find our trust in you. So Lord, be exalted. Indeed, all of the powers of this world are as nothing compared with your great power. And so our hope, our confidence, our trust we place in you. So continue to work in each heart and life. And Lord, especially for those who do not know you, who are not trusting in you, may this be the day when they hear this call of verses 9 and following, Oh, trust in the Lord. How foolish to trust in anything else. Come, trust in the Lord, for he is the one in whom we confidently place our trust. So, Lord, work in each of our hearts, receiving praise, honor, and glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.